Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. It is good to see a bunch of folks here. Some folks I haven't seen in a while, so it's good to see all folks who are here. If you're online, we welcome you to worship as well. The biggest, of course, change is that my family actually sat in the front row for the first time in three years. So, woo! I'm, get, I'm getting some looks that tell me that's not happening again next week. But, uh, but grateful for that. that you know, for the uh, first, like, 17 years, they were always front row people. And COVID did things to us. So, you know, we changed some patterns, and we recognize that that has changed patterns for lots of us. But we are grateful you are here with us, either online or in person. If you are online and haven't had an opportunity, we love for you to check in with the attendance link. We've learned that you can only do that once ever, and we'll fix that eventually. Um, but we'd just love to know that you are here with us. So if you've checked in with that before, you can just shoot an email and says, I was here with you in worship today. Because you get to see us, but we don't get to see you, and we'd love to see and know that you were with us in worship. Similarly, if you haven't already had a chance to pass your clipboard down your, your pew, that's one of those restored practices that we have brought back. So we invite the clipboard to go down so you all can tell us that you are here in worship. Later in worship, we're going to try a new experiment. We talked about this in session, that, we, that there are folks who would love if the passing of the peace could go back to having a handshake or hug for people who felt comfortable doing that and are really craving that touch. So here's how we're going to do this. This is going to feel a little weird, but we have to be a little weird, and we're good at that here. So when I invite you to do a passing of the peace, if you are not comfortable with physical touch, I invite you to remain seated and share the peace with a sign or a, a loving eye look contact with folks. If you do wish to pass the peace with handshake and hug, you may stand and thereby indicate that you all are safe for, for contact together. And we're just going to see if that works. And if that ends up feeling super awkward, we won't do it again. But if it ends up being good for the folks who miss the ability to, to get physical touch as a part of passing the peace, then that will be good. Uh, it is the last Sunday in August. Next week is Labor Day, and we're here as always. It's a, not a three-day week. Three-day weekends don't end church, so we hope to see you. The week after that, however, will be our kickoff Sunday. Kickoff Sunday is going to involve a barbecue out on the front lawn and inside, for those who don't want to be out on the front lawn, um, with hot dogs and hamburgers and varying meats, and we invite you to bring side dishes and desserts, and that's being worked out by somebody more organized than me. So uh, talk to Abigail or Susan Knights about how you get on to bringing food to that meal. It'll also be a time where we're advertising all the ways we are church and we are community together um, so it'll be time to learn about choir, about uh, adult education, children's education opportunities, small groups in the church, and we're going to try to have lots of information available to connect you to the way you wish to be connected as a community here. Um, we'll start Wednesday night choir practices and adult education and youth group on the Wednesday after that, which I believe is the 14th of September. Um, and uh, adult ed and choir, uh, adult ed's at 5.30, so choir members can get to 6.30 choir and do both. And um, youth group is at 6.30, I believe. So, um, so if you were a youth and so inclined, you could do both too. Uh, yeah, I don't see that happening. Um, but you can. Um, also, on the September 11th kickoff Sunday date, there will be both worship services, all our kickoff festivities, and then you can come back at 4 o'clock for the first even song of the 22-23 um, program year. Even song happens every other month. Um, it is a time from 4 to 5 p.m. It almost always ends within exactly 30 seconds of 5 p.m., um, and it's not because I am that diligent, but because Ryan is. And it is, a, it is similar to like a lessons and 
carols kind of service, organ and piano music um, with alternate poetic readings. Um, and it is a beautiful moment, and it is a whole lot better in person, but they are also streamed if you'd like to check one out on stream before you decide to come in person. So that will have its first one at 4 o'clock on the 11th. <sighs> Friends, breath is a holy thing. Losing breath is a holy problem. So may we take a deep breath. May we quiet our hearts and minds. And may we move now deeper into the heart of worship. Please join in the call to worship. Happy are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. We will praise you with an upright heart. With my whole heart, I seek you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Please be seated. And let us join in the prayer of confession. God of life, you consecrated us and made covenant with us. You will be our God and we will be your people. You have given us a law and a way, prophets and priests, teachers and healers who live your love among us. And yet, we find it all too easy to close our hearts to one another, to lose patience with those around us, to turn to judgment and self-interest. 
God, we need you, and we need each other, though we are loath to admit it. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. And continuing together, forgive us, O oh God, and move us to trust that we may boldly live your grace and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Friends, as we just sang, the mercies of our Lord are from everlasting to everlasting. They are eternal. Before we lift a word to confess, God has already forgiven us. Know that you, that we are forgiven and be at peace. As God's people receiving the reconciliation and love from God and sharing that with one another, we receive that peace and we share that peace now with one another, remembering that peace be with us all. Peace be with you. And you can share.
Please join in the prayer for illumination. Holy God, your word is a light in darkness and a source of blessing. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Enliven our hearts and minds as we hear your word for us today. Amen. The scripture for this morning is from the 34th chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through the first part of verse 11. As is clear from the text, this is Moses' second trek up Mount Sinai, where he will receive Commandments 2.0. Listen for God's word. The Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and do not let anyone be seen throughout all the mountain. And do not let flocks or herds graze in front of that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the former ones. And he rose up early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. He said, if now, I have, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. He said, I hereby make a covenant. Before all your people I will perform marvels such as not been performed in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you live shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you today. This is the word of the Lord. So um, sometimes in worship planning, I am amazed at how truly present the Holy Spirit is doing things that we would never have thought through and intended. And um, Ryan picked that opening hymn um, to use in worship on this, which is, a, which is the Sunday closest to my 10th anniversary. Um, and the third verse of that hymn, my former congregation sang every single week as a Gloria Patri. And so it was an interesting bracketing because as that tune went, I'm like, why do I know this tune so well? And then I, and we got to the third verse, I was like, oh, that's because we sang it just like the doxology every week in worship for eight years. Um, and so it kind of was a fun way to kind of think about um, what sent, sent, felt normal and every week to me 10 years ago when Caroline and I and three and a half of our children made the trek from Florida to, uh, to Idaho. I see that Marian Highland is here in worship. Um, I shared this on Facebook. I'd like to share it again. When uh, in the second interview that I did as potentially being um, called to be your pastor, as, as is done, like they have a sheet of questions they're going to ask, and they all decide who's going to ask which question. And Marion's question for me, and she was sitting right here um, on my Skype screen, I think, or oh, no, we were in person for that one. And she said, could you imagine staying here for seven years? And, and i sure that my answer took six years to give. Um, but uh, after the interview, 
I asked to have a copy of the questions so I could reflect on what were the things, you know, that they were asking about since this is a way to think about what a community thinks is really important. We were both in discernment. Do I want to be here? Do you want me to be here? Um, and I looked at the question Marion was supposed to have asked and it said, could you imagine being here for 10 years? And I said, Marion, you asked a different question. And she said, well, at the time, that felt more appropriate. Um, which I don't know if she was saying, I can't manage handling you for more than seven, <laughs> or I don't know if we can convince you to want to be here more than seven. I, maybe it was both. Um, but either way, seven or 10 has worked out. Um, and it's kind of amazing for me to think about um, that picture that personnel used um, to invite you all to think about this as a day to celebrate 10 years together and looking at what my family was 10 years ago versus what it is today um, is a pretty amazing thing. It is interesting because you are my family too for me to think about what it is to look on the picture that is us 10 years later. I think about Barbara Quickstad, and I think about folks like Barbara who aren't here among us, but are still in our great cloud of witnesses. Um, I think about faces that weren't here and weren't going to be here for years and years to come 10 years ago, um, and I'm not sure if I want to say you're lucky or we could have used you then, um, but I'm always remembered when we look backwards, right? which Israel spends a lot of time doing. When we look backwards, we have to remember, no matter what we have to say about a time we've come through, we today stand here only because of the people who got us here. Right? So Soren Kierkegaard in his book, Fear and Trembling, it's only appropriate that I quote Kierkegaard in a 10th anniversary sermon. Um, Fear and Trembling gets annoyed because he says, this generation only wants to talk about how we go further than those who have come before us. And he uses the example of Abraham's journey to Mount Moriah. This is the journey where he is going to sacrifice his son, his only son, the, the fulfillment of God's covenant promise to Abraham. And um, Kierkegaard says, the problem with us today is we imagine that we can start at the point f f past generations ended, like we don't have to retake the journey they were on right? So we receive a tradition with gratitude for those who came before us, but we also want to figure out what, what were they imagining and how do we come in to that tradition to say, what next? What's the next step we want to take? Um, and we've asked that question fairly often, I think, in the last 10 years. We even had a capital campaign called Next Step, right? Um, and I always, in those moments, remember a favorite Faulkner I can actually say it's the only Faulkner quote I like. He wasn't my favorite author. But there's a, a beautiful quote William Faulkner has that says, um, monuments are things we build to say this is how far we've come. And footsteps are a thing that we make when we say, I've come this farther and from here I take the next step. Right? And there's things that we've done here over which I am proud we renovated the sanctuary. We put a new, hopefully, 75 to 125 year roof on this building at a time when we told you you weren't allowed to come. I'm proud of those moments so long as they are not monuments to things we achieved, but they are footprints to think about where we want to go next. So I have tried to make a practice at every anniversary, and even more so now, to make the day nearest August 27th, the moment to look and say, where have we come from and where are we going? To that end, I looked up the first sermon I ever preached for you. Uh, learning session, never look up the first sermon you ever preached to somebody. Um, so some things we're grateful to put in the past and some things... Um, Part of that sermon, actually, that I loved was talking about the journey of Lewis, Lewis and Clark. That Lewis and Clark set about on a journey that wasn't possible. They set about to find the all-water route to the Pacific. And as you know, but they didn't. It doesn't exist. And it's a metaphor that gets used in the church a lot because at one point, they found themselves trying to canoe the Bitterroot Mountains. 
at which point they had to trade in their canoes for horses. Um, And the church itself often finds itself trying to canoe the 21st century. Who is God calling us to be today, given the world we inhabit, is a challenging question because who we were 10 years ago had some things we loved about it. We were recently in a session meeting and we talked about the fact that we are not uh, attempting to bring back Logos, which was our children's Wednesday night program. Uh, If you don't know this, the task force that created Logos, I started on my very first day of work. That's right, they tell a new pastor, do nothing for the first year, but listen and preach and do pastoral care. And I started a task force on my very first day. But I could see from the beginning we needed to find a way to invest in our children, that we had choir and youth group and adult studies happening on Wednesday, but absolutely nothing for children. So we set about saying, what do we, how do we want to do that? Um, it, uh, so in the session meeting on Monday, it was named that we're not going to have Logos. Not right now and maybe never again. And a couple of members who were very involved and who I owe a lifelong debt of gratitude for giving their energy to it were really sad. It was such a beautiful moment. The cook team, the Caroline, Caroline's cook team, um, the, the way back when cook teams that involved Ruth and John and, and uh, Hicks and Joe Gailey and Ruth and Gailey uh, that were the predecessor to Logos on Wednesday night supper, uh, they were fond, wonderful memories. And as someone who put a lot of actually blood and tears into those memories, um, I too am sad that we can sit here in this moment in time and say we're not going to do logos on Wednesday nights for the foreseeable future. But what we're hearing from young families is they won't be able to come or it's not a thing that they can make a priority right now with the energy loss that has been COVID with the rampant exhaustion that is in our society. And so there's a beautiful moment in which you can say logos helped to get us here And it's not going to work right now to move us forward. And so we, with blessing and gratitude, prune that troop off our tree. Not that we no longer love it, but that it can't keep going forward. And us lamenting what isn't is a bad use of our energy. Right, And so we're going to try family fun days, and we invite you to make that as intergenerational as possible. Every other Sunday, we'll stick around after this service, and we will engage intergenerationally, and we will stand up and tell you the same things are true that we told you about Logos. The more adults a child and youth learns to know and love in their church, the more likely that they will stay in a community of faith for the rest of their life. The investment is the function that we're after. The form it takes doesn't matter. So family fun days and logos are two different ways to achieve the same purpose. Part of what we do when we look back and look forward is say, as long as we're still trying to fulfill our purpose and our mission, that's what's important. Dogmatically having to do it the way we want to is the obstacle we have to overcome. My first summer here, we knew at that time that some of you were here. Uh, Some of you, this won't be the fondest memory. We used to have three worship services. We had a, um, what some described as get God and go chapel service. That was great for people who wanted to go. The Thomases are nodding their heads, diehard members of it right? You could come worship at 8 o'clock in the chapel and then drive up to Bogus Basin and ski the rest of the day or whatever your inclination was. And so we had a, a chapel service at 8. We had um, a, a, bit, a larger, more traditional service at like 10. And then we had a 5 p.m. praise team contemporary service. Uh, but when I walked in, we had about 130 people, 140 people across those three services. And one of the first things I said was, we're going to have to get rid of some worship services. 
we don't know each other because we're all in our very different worship experiences. But I figured that was definitely a year two thing, right? Except all of a sudden there got energy on the worship team and we started to tackle it at the end of year one. And we decided that we were going to do a summer in which we would offer only the traditional service as one service where we'd all come together. And we would have Sunday school and then the traditional worship. Uh, and on the floor of session, the motion got changed. And it was instead decided we would only do contemporary worship for the summer. This is the lead up to the part of the story I like. Later that evening, I'm at Catalpa Park because it's the park next to my kids' elementary school, and they're playing on the park. And I was on the phone on the side of the park, as people do, talking to Bonnie Lind, who has subsequently moved to Portland and moved back home and is right over there on personnel again. And she was the chair of personnel at that time. So I'm talking to Bonnie, and I said, Bonnie, I just bought a house, and the church is going to die. Like, like, like in full, like I wasn't being hyperbolic. This was my, I was convinced. I was convinced the church was going to die because the session had made a decision that made no sense and that most people were going to, with their bodies, vote against by not coming. I was like, this is a really small town. There are no other church gigs. And I just bought a house. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. And Bonnie, I can remember it said to me, Andrew, Trust the process. I have subsequently made a life, a, a life vow to remind myself constantly that God is in this. So things beyond our kin are happening all around. By the way, the church did not vote to have only contemporary worship. But we did survive the summer, and we did experiment, and subsequently, we did go down to a single worship service, and then we started a second one back on Wednesdays for two years, and then we brought that back in as first light on Sundays, trying to be both early for chapel people and contemporary for praise band people, and, um, and it has been a fun, organic, playful attempt to figure out how can we worship as people who have very different desires about how we worship. And 10 years later, I would like to say to you all, I am grateful for your willingness to not have everything be exactly as you need it to be. Because that's the only way forward. One of the other values for me as a church coming in, as a pastor coming in, I had come from a church of which I was very proud and whose colleagues I loved a lot. But one of the things that always challenged me was we believed in being what we call the centrist church, which some people would call a purple church, which means of people that are both Republicans and Democrats, or people who are both theologically conservative and people who are theologically liberal. Um, but in that church, I always felt like the way we achieved that was by not being authentic to who we were. If we just didn't talk about anything controversial, we could all get along. And a value to me when I came here was to say, we're going to talk about those things, but we're going to try to do that in a way that allows us, all of us, to never be fully right and never be fully wrong. There are times... A lot of times, I am sure, when we don't hit that mark correctly. But I am grateful to a congregation who attempts to make space for each other here, whomever that each other is. And I think it's the only way forward for the church. I regularly find myself in places where I'm hearing Shouts from one side and shouts from another side, both claiming a certain amount of purity and disdain for the other. And what I'm convinced of is that there's no way forward in that world where we can't sit in the same room and recognize that neither one of us fully grasps what the future holds. But each of us needs each other to correct our limited vision. And I'm grateful that you've been willing to walk that journey here. 
from the first day that I walked in here, frankly, 20, 30, 40 years before I walked in here, this building has been a place of great resource and of great burden. And very early on in sitting with our admin and operations people, it was clear to me that we had to decide whether we wanted to stay in this building or not. For those of you who weren't here 10 years ago, you don't know that we had those conversations. Is this church capable of maintaining a 60,000 square foot building in the heart of downtown Boise as 300 people? When I came, we were claiming to be 400 but we were really 200. And, um, and it was important for us to decide if that's a value for us, then how are we gonna make that work? How are we gonna make that work in which it be, does not become the anchor around our life where we can't do vital ministry and mission because all we're doing is maintaining a building. We didn't want a monument. And we have worked hard to imagine this building as a mission resource to our larger community. And uh, if you don't know what that means, you'll see that really easily on Monday and Tuesdays when that narthex looks like the produce section of a grocery store that has had a tornado go through it. There are many places, and in the past we have even been such a place, that would say that as holy and sacred ground, we shouldn't be using it to run a food pantry. I have heard critiques in the community when we bring outside groups in regularly to use our space that we're hardly a church anymore, which is one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that we are a community stewarding a space and making it a resource for our entire community, reaching out to our neighbors to say, we're here to provide you a place to do what you do well, that we are fostering an appreciation of beauty and wonder and curiosity and neighborliness with one of the resources that could otherwise be a burden on our life. And so I have said for 10 years, and I'll keep saying, I don't know if for 10 more, but I'll keep saying for as long as I'm here, what you don't understand is you are the least users. I don't know how grammatically to say that. Judy will fix me later. Uh, I don't know that you are the least users of this building. There are more people here on Monday through Saturday than there are on Sunday, and that's not a bad thing. I think the church, Big C Church, Protestant mainline church in the 21st century is way behind our curve in figuring out how to maintain buildings that aren't albatrosses but are modes of mission beyond what we do on Sunday mornings. Just this last week, I met with personnel to look at the 2023 budget. We call that August. It sucks. And you look up numbers, you know these numbers, you understand what it is like to live in a world with 9% inflation, right? Now figure out how to do right by your employees in a world with 9% inflation in which just to make sure that everyone who works here gets the same health care and the same buying power next year that they have had this year, we would have to increase our budget by $60,000 which we won't be able to do, but we will wrestle with in provocative ways to find the middle tension point between not having staff who has to essentially volunteer at their jobs and not have um, a world where we are being realistic about how we do what we do and that we require your generosity to do it. I'm only telling you this now, that's a spoiler alert for another month or two from now. I'm telling you this now because everyone is starting to wake up to the reality that the church is going to have to find different funding structures. 
And we're all having a conversation right now internally that I'm hoping we can make wider. Um, having that conversation with Ryan for what it looks like to create a fine arts 501c3 that runs this building to help try to get the building to pay for itself. So the congregation who is but one user of that building is funding its mission and ministry and not maintenance and repairs. And I think we're out in front on that conversation, though it's a bridge we don't know how to build because there's not a lot of models. And I'm grateful for a community that 10 years ago said, yes, we're okay sharing the space we call home. Which, yes, means occasionally, if you forget to get on the calendar in time, you won't get to do your program in your church because someone else will be doing their program in our church. And that's a gift you've given and a burden you carry. And I'm grateful you've been willing to do it because I think that's the kind of foresight the church of the 21st century needs. We provide space for worship, to get food that you need to put on your table for your kids, for nonprofit boards to meet, for AA groups. For uh, There's a new group meeting here on, uh, I won't name it because it's an anonymous group, for codependents. They have three of them, and Andrew usually makes a joke about, well, that's triangulation when three codependents get together. But... But I'm so grateful to know that one more group said, we've heard you give space. And that's the work of the church, even if it doesn't have the church's logo on it. One of the areas that I'm aware of and hearing and teaching, Kristen helps to reflect this back from her, um, her profession in, as a higher education staff is our youth, and you know this, our youth and our children are not as a large scale okay. COVID has taken a lot away from our mental health well-being. It's not just our children and our youth. It's all of us. Statistically, 13 to 19 year olds are 50% likely to be carrying major diagnosable trauma. And I think that if we had the stats in front of us for five to 13 year olds, it would be at least the same. And we haven't figured out as a church how to be a resource in that conversation. We share a parking lot that causes a lot of angst with the high school. And we have the angst of nasty grams on car hoods of students who don't understand it's not the school's parking lot. But I'd love that instead to become a place of reparative ministry. Where is our witness to our youth that we love them and that we are a place where they can speak and have real conversations? about the challenges. I'm aware as a parent and a father, uncomfortable kid moment, I get it, that I haven't been as out in front of countering cultural voices that are creating the anxiety in our children, of reminding my kids that they can choose the wrong college and their life will still be wonderful. And so I see the anxiety and I see how I haven't been out in front of that anxiety saying, don't listen to these voices that are telling you otherwise. And I'm wondering where is we as a church, where are we getting out in front of that conversation? Where are we using our location to reach people who will never walk in this building because they are so convinced that we are a place of hypocrisy and judgment that we're going to have to go to them. And I mean we. Not Abigail, not me, not the session, not our deacons, but where are we as a church taking on a mission to be a community that is about restoration and togetherness? Years ago, so when I fly on my own, when I fly on my own, oh man, what did I do now? 
Okay, when the, when the peanut gallery that is my family starts laughing, I know I'll learn about it later. When I fly on my own, I love to watch bad movies. Right, I'm a I'm a big fan of a C minus movie. You know, uh, I I watch them when Caroline's falling asleep at home on my iPad or when I'm flying. There's this movie. It's something. It's like called Monster Hunters. Anyway, it's a kind of a half comedy, half adventure where uh, big insects have taken over the world and everybody lives in these little enclaves. And there's it starts with this kid who's sort of ill fitting, not very physical. He doesn't feel like he's a value to his enclave. But he sits on a radio, and these little enclaves use old ham radios to talk together. I watched this movie in the first air flight I had taken since COVID. And I got convinced that this was a beautiful movie about ecclesiology. That more than ever, what the world needs is not churches with steeples and pews, but communities dedicated to be covenantally committed to each other. I know you're wondering why in the world I chose that scripture, right? I love the beginning of it because I love you, Mom, but she has some passive-aggressive tendencies, and I love that God says, so we're going to write on these tablets again, Bring some tablets just like the ones you broke, right? That was when Moses hucked them because they had made the golden calf, right? If you're wondering about the tablets he broke, they didn't slip out of his hands, right? He returned with the tablets to a people who had made an idol out of gold, and he threw the tablets and they broke. And God is just reminding Moses, we wouldn't have to do this if you had done it right the first time. But that's the gift of covenant, because we're doing this for the 787,000th time. And God, who knows we won't hold to our side of the bargain, is still saying, bring a tablet just like the one you broke, and let's do this again. And I'm convinced that the world that we're headed into has got some really major issues to deal with increasing numbers of pandemics, questions about what is going on with our environment, whatever their cause is, it's going to be harder for us to live, questions of overpopulation, of racial intolerance, of what it means to be in this together and who is actually us. I think we have some really, really hard conversations coming. I think life's going to get harder, not easier, and more than ever, I want us to be sitting with our ham radio calling on each other and saying, I'm here with you to the end of the age. As God has said to us, generation after generation after generation. And so while we're living in a period where I'm asking the staff to think how we get people to come back to church, how we imagine what it means to regrow the tendons and the muscles that connect us as people rather than just the bones of what was. As we think about these conversations, we together need to be a community who has said, whatever else is true will show up tomorrow as we did yesterday. If you read the gospel, Peter gets almost nothing right. Peter has a failing grade on every pop quiz. But every day he shows up again to take the next quiz. That's the trait of discipleship. That is what it means to be a resilient enclave of togetherness. And that's what the world needs us to be. Whether you come or not, whether you like all of it or not, we're here for you this day, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.
Please remain standing as you are able and join in the affirmation of faith. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the Church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. Good morning. We, the personnel committee, are so glad you're all here today to help us celebrate Andrew's 10th anniversary. And I realize now I should have coordinated with Andrew because he stole all, almost all my thunder. <laughs> but we'll do our best. It was August 27, 2012, when Andrew first joined First Presbyterian Church. What a leap of faith, moving from Florida, eight states away, two time zones, but a blessing for all of us. And when he got here, he jumped in, just as he said, leading outstanding worship services and Bible studies that are inspiring, relevant, and enjoyable. He laughed with newlyweds, cried with those who were mourning their loss. He developed solid financial footing, led two highly successful campaigns for worship, uh, which transformed this building, uh, but old building into a safe 21st century for worship, feeding the communities homeless and food insecure, child care, AA groups, weddings, memorials, and premier community music concerts. He built exceptional congregational leadership through active engagement with staff, session elders and volunteers. Truly, let's just say that First Presbyterian Church has become an environment of radical hospitality. That was supposed to get a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew leads by example and speaks up when it matters. His strong leadership encourages inclusion, breadth, and direction. FPC's mission and its partners like Catch have flourished under Andrew's leadership. From the beginning, he supported and encouraged FPC's mission committees, committees and volunteers to think big and get it done. And I want to add that he was able to do a lot of this because of the support and hands-on involvement of his amazing Kukla family. Caroline, Warren, Elizabeth, Meredith, Danielle, you will see some or all of them at almost every service and event, cooking, playing music, reading liturgy, cleaning, packing food, whatever needs to be done. So thank you very much, Aunt Kukla family. And if you would, would you come forward, please? And Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I have to say something about the last comment. <laughs> 
So <laughs> radical hospitality was a value of our Next Step campaign, and Tom was brought in as part of the financial team, and we were like sharing the value statements of that campaign that would guide us when we had debates about what, you know, how, where to spend money. And when we got to radical hospitality, Tom was like, I don't know about that radical word. <laughs> <laughs> So I appreciate that you included that in it there. It truly Tom. has become that. So Andrew, thank you. And we hope you stay another 10 years to lead us through the next steps and beyond. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Um, with that, I want to invite you all to join us after worship in Lindsay Hall for a celebration of Andrew's 10th anniversary uh, where cake and coffee and fellowship and with that, would you all please join us in singing to the Cuckoos? <laughs> We're going to sing. discovering the most awkward thing you could ever do to us. <laughs> I want to share one Good. other thing because I'm being texted by my parents and because those of you who are parents of adult children know what it's like to, to live your life hoping the best for them and not getting to make their decisions for them. And I'm pretty sure my parents had hoped that you'd be a terrible fit and we would move back to Chicago. <laughs> but they are deeply grateful to know that we are in a place that, that we love so much and that has loved us so well. So thank you. Oh yeah, I got to do that. We come to a time in worship where we say, okay, we've, we've said a lot of words, but are we going to do them? And we come to time to think about how are we going to live this and be this church all seven days, 24 hours of the week. So I invite you to think on not just what ways do you want to join our ministry and supporting it, but how do we want to live these values in our daily lives? Let us give to God. God's tithes and our offering.
Amen. Please be seated. Uh, a quick word. One of the other things I love about y'all is you don't necessarily get up at 1146 and go to the uh, lunch line. I am c cognizant as a as a constant clock watcher in worship, that we are over time. But I've also committed to never make that mean I won't take prayers from the community. So if you have to go, no one is judging you. But let us move into, except you, sit down. <laughs> Matt was offended that we didn't include him in the roles of Kukla kids. So uh, just so you know, just because Caroline has to parent you doesn't make you a Kukla. <laughs> prayers, Donna. Run. For uh, a dear friend, Alan, whose adult children are trying to run his life. There's a lot of resonation with that. Yes. Whatever normal life is, but uh, prayers of thanksgiving for Jonathan, who we have been praying for in his cancer journey and has a lot of l abundant life present in his current condition. Victoria. For the Flynn family, who are friends with the Thomases and three young kids at home, and he has been in a coma for two weeks after a bad mountain biking accident. So we pray for them and for the community of support around him. Yes. Joanne. From Nancy Ives. Hello, Nancy. I know you're watching. We love you, and we're praying for your recovery. for the challenging journey of being adult children of folks whose lives are in transition and the ongoing uh, working of the health journey for Francis and Ruth um, in what is and isn't possible. Yes, Bay. Uh, for my friend Sue, who is a good neighbor, um, just passed away with some heart issue and it was really a shock for, the, for her and for the family. For, uh, a neighbor friend, Sue, who passed away kind of unexpectedly due to heart issues and the, sort of the shock to the system for the rest of the family in their grief. We pray, yes. Christina. Prayers for Grace's grandkids, which are Christina's parents, or grandparents, which are Christina's parents as they make the transition to assisted, independent living and all of the gray area between those two. Yes, Daniel. Prayers for world peace. Thank you. I'm going to call you a disciple of Skip Dautel, and there could be worse things in life than that. Are there other prayers that we would like to lift up? Yes, Joanne. Are we jealous or are we praying for safety for them? <laughs> Skip and Pat ha, uh, had planned a Great Lakes cruise before COVID, and they're finally going on it. Um, so a prayer of safe travels, of fun adventure, and for the joy of getting to do a thing long deferred. Um, friends, let us continue together in prayer. Oh God, we are grateful that in your holiness, you have always chosen relationship over righteousness. And so no matter how many times we get it wrong or fail to conceive of the boldness of your vision for creation, you have covenanted with us over and over again that you will be our God and we will endeavor to be your people. 
And so we, your people, sit here in a holy space contemplating how to be holy people in the world, and we lift up to you the particular prayers we've named, the joys and the laments, the challenges and the needs for strength. And we lift up to you those we don't yet have the words to articulate, but we are fumbling with like sand through our fingers. O oh God, you who spoke world into being, be for us the one whose light and life gives us firm ground. As we move out into our life and into our daily lives, as we contemplate what does it mean to be a community of faith in this day and in this place, continue to inspire us with boldness, strengthen us with love, and help guide us to be the church as you would want us to be, praying all the while the words your son gave us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us stand and sing our closing hymn together. I was meeting this week with someone from Presbytery, and I was trying to help them understand a thing, that there's, there's a weirdness to this church. Um, you see, if you're a Presbyterian in Idaho, you think First Presbyterian is the big steeple church, right? We're the biggest thing on the Presbyterian block. And I said, that, that is not wrong, but on this block, we're the smallest thing going. 
right? Like we're next to Cathedral of the Rockies, which is like the fastest growing Methodist church west of the Mississippi and has something like 4,000 members. St. Michael's is a true cathedral, not just one that calls itself one. And, uh, and you got, sorry, I couldn't help it. And you got St. John's. And, and all of us have exactly the same size buildings because in 1952, that's who we were when we built this place. Um, but by comparison, we're a tenth the size of our neighbors. Um, and so when people come here and they say, I'd like to join your ministry for people who are 32 and on their second marriage with three kids, <laughs> I say, Cathedral of the Rockies is right over there. I really, I do, because that's what they want, and that's where they should go. Um, we're weird. We're a smaller community of faith in a large building who can't do many of those things and is okay with that because that's what makes us who we are. And so my uh, unofficial mission statement for this church has always been that we're a quirky group of Christians who have fun being serious about our faith. And I'm grateful that you are that, that we are that, and that we will continue to be that. So may we go forth and show resilience and love, openness and committedness to the world because that's what God is to us. And as we go to do that, know that you are the object of the greatest love that ever was, is, and ever shall be. And may that be your peace. Amen.